Hello, and welcome to the Nursing Economics podcast series. This series provides extended content relating to articles published in the journal, such as author interviews and roundtable discussions. In this episode, public health nurse and health reporter Barbara Glickstein discusses the importance of the nurse voice with interviewer Giselle Girardi. Ms. Glickstein discusses the economic, professional, and social implications of speaking up as nurses and being heard through the media. Ms. Glickstein provides advice to help nurses become engaged and be heard while sharing her perspectives and experiences. Barbara Glickstein is the Director of Communication, Media Projects at the Center of Health Policy and Media Engagement at George Washington University School of Nursing. She is a nurse consultant to Carolyn Jones Productions and worked on the feature-length documentaries The American Nurse and Defining Hope and the multimedia project Dying in America. Giselle Girardi is a full-time clinical assistant professor at Stony Brook University in Stony Brook, New York. She holds a faculty position in the Applied Health Informatics Master's Program and is an adjunct clinical instructor in the School of Nursing in the Stony Brook BSN Program. Ms. Girardi's clinical experience focuses in maternal child health, and she has a wide array of experience working with antepartum, intrapartum, and postpartum women, both in community and acute settings. Ms. Girardi is a co-principal investigator in a project funded by the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. This project aims to help connect older adults with technology to improve their ability to access health information. She is a Jonas Health Policy Scholar for 2018 to 2020 and is currently working on her PhD in nursing science at the City University of New York at the Graduate Center. We are now pleased to present Giselle Girardi's interview with Barbara Glickstein. It's a privilege to have the opportunity to interview Barbara Glickstein for the Nursing Economics podcast series. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you. It's really good to be here and to talk with you about our work. Thank you again for your time. Can you start by telling our listeners about how you merged your professional nursing career with health media and policy? I'm a public health nurse, and I see my work in the media as my public health practice. Um, It's a platform that allows me to talk about um, public health, about policy, and about politics of healthcare. And for me, that's the identity as the public health nurse that I have cultivated and worked in. Um, I was raised in a family where national and global news was discussed at dinner almost every evening. Um, My parents were very engaged in the community. Um, They knew their local elected officials. They were working class people who understood policy and its implications, and I learned that very early on. Um, They actually also taught myself and my siblings that if we saw something wrong and it needed to be changed, we weren't allowed to complain. We had to do something. So I believe that led me to develop a voice that I see myself as an engaged citizen, I vote at every election, and that I actually have a way of influencing policy. So convergence of my interest in policy and media probably goes back to my family roots and in a sense that I can use that platform as a nurse to help influence individual families and communities as well as elected officials on how to vote on issues and what policies are critically important to the health and well-being of our nation. Excellent. So why do you think it's important for nurses to be engaged through the media? Well, you know, health news shapes the public's perceptions of what's important and who's important in health care. So when we're missing, us nurses are missing from stories in the news, how will the public ever really get a full picture of what it is that we do about the experience of health and wellness and illness and how to care for yourself and for others. So not everyone wants to be engaged in the media, and I respect that. But there is a larger percentage of nurses that must become engaged in the media, and that's across the board from those who are uh, in academia and teaching nursing, whether it's um, in clinical research or policy, uh, whether it's uh, nurses in the community providing um, health care and nursing care in community health centers, in the home, 
in, in our institutions, as well as nurses in labor in the labor force working in corporations. Every setting that nurses are in with that area of expertise are tremendously important sources for the news media, uh, reflecting on the economics of healthcare. Speaking of the journal that you are producing this podcast for, we understand. Uh, the chief nursing officer of, of a major hospital has to know the budget, has to know what works, has to know where waste is, has to know how to um, run that budget of the largest workforce in that institution. So that is why it is important. Not only do we help the public understand what it is that we do, but also that it is important that healthcare is defined through many lenses, and when the nurse's lens and frame is missing, the public suffers and we suffer. Absolutely, especially since nurses are one of the most trusted people in this country. You know, I can definitely see why it's important for us to be engaged. Um, right, so let me tell you something about this trusted poll every year. I know it. And I know that the one year that we weren't the number one trusted profession was 9-11 when firefighters and first responders took it. I would say that that's a leverage point for us. You said it. If we are the most trusted, don't just pat us on the head every year when that poll comes out. Interview us. Find out what our expertise is. Find out what we know. Ask us about our research. And as nurse researchers, learn and understand how to translate your research into what is public information. And that's a skill that can be taught. And that's a skill that everyone needs to learn. Yeah, definitely. And talking about the absent nurse voice in the media, what do you feel are the economic implications of this missing voice? I think we can talk about that across a wide range of, of issues. You know, the workforce issue is up front and central right now, whether it's the scope of practice for nurses across the United States uh, in each state addressing archaic obstacles and legislative laws that have kept nurse practitioners and DNPs uh, from fully being able to practice to the extent of their education and their clinical expertise. That is creating not only a lack of access to care, particularly primary care, particularly in rural communities, but not just in rural communities. So we have an economic situation where people are getting sicker and have no access to primary care. Their, their access points are hit in a terribly dramatic way. And so we see more health care being needed further along down the line because of a lack of uh, good primary care and prevention services. So not only is it impacting these citizens in these areas, it's also impacting nurses who can't go, who want to practice in those areas, to be able to set up a practice and take care of the communities that they wish to serve. Also, people in, you know, people have been talking about for a number of years, would it be different in institutions like our academic medical centers if nurses actually were billable, um, if their services and clinical services were actually line by line clinically billed? Um, we are staffed and paid salaries, and the structure, I'm not suggesting this as an answer. I have some different views about that, which we can talk about or not, but that when we're not seen as a value in a budget in terms of the the actual work that is done, the assessments, the um, skills and knowledge set, the post-surgical care, the ICU care, the prenatal care, across the spectrum of the lifespan in the hospital settings, our value is not one that perhaps is best being utilized as well as being paid. We also know that there is a gender discrepancy and imbalance between male nurses and female nurses. Although most nurses are women, the ranges anywhere from 90 to 93 percent, where only 7 to 9 percent of nurses are men, we do know that men are making higher salaries across the board than nurses are, which is not easily explained nor uh, acceptable to me. So there are issues of gender bias and salary. Um, so I think that the, you know, I raised the question when we did the Woodhull study, which we can talk about in a moment, that if 93 percent of nurses were men, would we be seeing more of them in the news? 
So I think that there are economic issues across the board. We know nurses are creating amazing models of care. The American Academy of Nursing has the Edge Runner series, where nurses have come up with not only brilliant clinical models of care, but have also done the research and have economic sustainability issues, looking at how to both upscale the models of care that they've developed, saving money and capturing lives. So we have programs where we're keeping our elders at home, where most elders want to live, with nursing care that is provided, not just in acute situations. So there are many, many um, exceptionally high-quality models of care that if people, the public doesn't know about them because they're not being exposed, either translated from the research to public information in the media, the public doesn't know about them, the policymakers don't know about them, and we stay small in our big ideas. And that's what I'd like to see changed. Absolutely. It reminds me of the old nursing adage, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So, exactly. Yeah, basically. Exactly. And, if, then, if we're and not... that is very, very true. It, if you didn't document it, it didn't happen. Yeah, I so... remember that well from nursing school myself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So as nurses, we definitely need to start speaking about these issues or the public doesn't know that these are issues and nobody wants to vote on these issues or help support these issues or understand the value of supporting nurses in improving the quality of life and health care. Exactly. You started bringing up the Woodhall study, so why don't we move on to that? Can you tell us a little bit about the original study? And it was recently revisited by yourself and some of your colleagues. Um, so can you expand That's on that? That's correct. In 1997, published in 1998, the Woodhall study of nurses in the media, media found that nurses were quoted as sources in health news stories only 4% of the time in leading print newspapers and only 1% of the time in print weeklies and trade publications like Modern Healthcare. 20 years later, Dr. Diana Mason, Dr. Christy Welsman, Laura Nixon from Berkeley Studies Media Group is the research group that we contracted with to perform the data on this. Uh, we collaborated on a three-phase study. The first was replicating the data portion of the study. And the reason why is we wanted to see, was there any improvement in, um, in nurses used as sources? Were journalists using nurses as sources in their story? And what uh, whether uh, there were improvements in the representation of women overall based on the fact that, again, nurses are predominantly a woman workforce. As I said, the reason why this is important is that we do know that the media and the influence of the media on influencing people's lives and influencing policy is critical. So if nurses are missing from these stories, the public's really not getting a full picture. And of course, we can also talk about that the Institute of Medicine's report, you know, in 2010 talked about the future of nursing and how we were going to be making inroads. And some of that had to do with leadership and how the public really understands us. So this team of researchers, uh, the principal investigator is Dr. Diana Mason. Uh, she uh, led the team and we did this uh, study. So the replication of the study was slightly different because um, unfortunately a, no a couple of the daily newspapers have uh, in 20 years have folded and many of those publications are now online or some of those publications that still exist are online. What's interesting, I just want to add, is that in 1997, it was Nancy Woodhull, whom the study is uh, named for, the original study. Uh, she had experienced health care during her hospitalization for her treatment of cancer. And she was the founding editor of USA Today, a major newspaper in the United States. And she was struck by the fact that her experience in the direct care of nurses really helped her see the role of nursing in a very unique way that most people who have had a, a serious illness and have had that kind of engagement with nursing get an immediate sense of the role of the use of our intellect, our skills, our education, and our ability to care for very sick people. And she was also very interested in trying to understand why women were so underrepresented in the media. And so she spoke with um, some of her colleagues, and uh, ultimately it was Sigma Theta Tau International, mm -hmm. as well as the University of Rochester School of Nursing, that agreed to conduct a study. And it w that study was done. They approached the study as an elective course on nurses in the media for undergraduate students back in 1997, and the students were trained in data collection. So um, Sigma Theta Tau published the first study, 
And as I mentioned, nurses were only quite in 4%. So our collaboration with the Berkeley Media Studies Group to replicate the original study, unfortunately, did not find things had changed very much at all. As a matter of fact, um, our study showed that only 2% of all quotations or articles were quoting nurses as sources. And uh, that the it was not statistically significant from the 4% because of the closing of a couple of those publications and now online. So we're suggesting that no change has occurred. Nurses were mentioned in only 13% of the articles, and most of those stories were about the nursing profession, about labor, about uh, scope of practice, etc. They were not sourced in stories on research, policy, or the economics and business of healthcare. So we do remain pretty invisible in health news stories. And our second phase of our study, uh, which I'll just briefly tell you, is that we did a qualitative study by interviewing 10 health reporters and asked them through our interview process whether did they use nurses as sources and what did they perceive to be the barriers and facilitators to using nurses as stories in their health news reporting. And some of that will um, be further published in articles that are coming out over the next couple of months. But I can just tell you that what we discovered from that qualitative part of the study was that there's biases about women, uh, nurses and positions of power in the healthcare system get in the way of using diverse sources in health reporting. And I would say across the board, uh, the journalists said that when nurses were used in a, as sources in, in their news reporting, they really enriched the story. They were great teachers. They, they were terrific at explaining, making it in plain language, ways that people can understand things, as well as they were really good storytellers. So we, the third part of the study had to do with schools of nursing and Twitter, and I'll just briefly say that part of the study was done by my colleague, Dr. Kimberly Aquaviva at George Washington University School of Nursing. And uh, for those who are interested in the full research brief, you can go to the George Washington University School of Nursing on the homepage is the Woodhull study with that research brief. And I'll just comment that what was discovered on that phase of the study is that most schools of nursing are using their Twitter accounts as a marketing tool and basically only talking to each other. And they are not using hashtags that would necessarily attract a journalist to, who's looking for a story on, let's say, diabetes when they're featuring a faculty member who's just published a story, published an article, a research paper on diabetes. Um, that's not being used in the best interest of using social media to expand out. So that study was very revealing. And I think for schools of nursing that have an interest in using their social media platforms as a way of expanding beyond marketing to get students to come to their school, they may want to take a look at that data as well. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. While we're on that topic, what are other ways that nurses at every level can become engaged in health and social policy? I think that the first thing, you know, I've taught, to, I've taught health policy a couple of times, and the first thing I would um, say, which is quite simple, but I think with everyone's busy lives, often we don't read the newspaper every day, and, and I realize that's something that you must grow a passion for. Um, there are some great resources that help curate uh, important health stories, and I'll mention them. Uh, Kaiser Health News is one. The Washington Post has some very good health reporting. The other source that I use on a daily basis is STAT, which is uh, published out of Boston, and it's called STAT News. It comes into my mailbox every morning, and it curates some of the top news stories. Kaiser Health News is a really easy skim in the morning. You can tag the story that is an important one for you to remember. But I would say first and foremost that nurses have to understand what's going on in the politics of nurse care, of healthcare and be versed in that as well. If you're in school or thinking about going back to school, I would certainly look to see if they're offering a both undergraduate and graduate course in health policy. It should be part, I think, of every nursing school. That's my bias. I think that perhaps for some nurses, housing might be the issue, the social policy issue. They work in a in an urban center there in the ER. They see that homelessness and families who are living in homeless situations and shelters, let that be your passion. I really encourage people everywhere, not just nurses, 
who say, how do you, how do you stay politically active? How do you, you know, where do you find the energy for it? And I tell them, I follow the issues that I'm really passionate about. I really care about. It drives me to do as much as I can to support the change that needs to be done. So my issue on what health policy or social policy someone listening to this podcast should embark on is to really sit and reflect for a minute and think about what do I care about? If it's your children's school issue and there isn't a school nurse, get involved in that issue. If it's um, environmental pollution and the increasing in what we're seeing of, you know, in, in low resource communities where there is terrible, you know, bus depots and car fumes and trucks that ride by, get involved in environmental policy. I think our best work is when we are aligned with something that matters to us. And it's not selfish. It's really that that will fuel your engagement. And um, But staying abreast of the news is critically important. Taking a course in health policy, if you're involved in your professional nursing association, take that trip to Albany or Washington, D.C. If you live in New York, Albany, whatever state you live in, and uh, go on a lobby day. It's a hugely informative experience, and you may discover what that issue is that your elected official needs to have your voice heard because you're an expert on many issues, and particularly that issue that might need your voice to be said at that meeting or that letter that you're going to write. Absolutely. And once that issue is identified, what are the various media platforms that you recommend nurses should use to share these ideas, awareness, and passions? I'm a big believer in local newspapers. I subscribe to my local newspapers. They are you know, come out once a week. And I have encouraged in my media training that I do that it's not a bad idea. It's actually a really good idea to see, are they covering local health news? Or maybe you can respond to a letter um, about an article that was written that completely missed the point about what the issue is. Uh, And so I make sure you sign yourself off in that letter to the editor with your RN degree and whatever other degrees that you have, advanced degrees. I would also suggest that Uh, Although not everybody wants to be engaged on social media platforms, this is not a prescription of must, but if you are using Facebook, if you're using Instagram, if you're on Twitter, those are platforms that are ways of engaging and finding other people, both in nursing and in healthcare and in politics that you can both follow and get a better grip on where they stand on certain issues. Um, I do recommend that nurses follow health reporters. They're local health reporters. They should know who they are. They should be aware of who the reporter is on their local radio station that they listen to, whatever station that might be. And when their comfort level of feeling competent about media engagement Write to that person, uh, say, you know, hey, I just read this article that you wrote about in terms of gun violence, and I'm a school nurse, and I have very strong feelings about the role of school nurses in identifying concerns of children in populations now that we're missing. Uh, Mental health is a serious concern. Uh, Gun safety in schools is a serious concern. I'm available to be interviewed the next time you cover this topic. So local newspapers, for sure, your local radio station, and if you're a TV watcher of the news, know who's the health reporter on your local affiliate as well. Uh, Those are the people that need to know about you. If you are moving in the direction of letting the platforms that are available to you, where you don't have to rely on a journalist uh, to be interviewing you, you can use that space both on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, One recommendation that recently was such a great one by a health reporter colleague friend of mine was um, that she goes to some of the Facebook groups that nurses run for people living with uh, caregivers of Alzheimer's or um, geriatric health issues or diabetes to name some of the popular ones and she goes there and she'll contact the nurse administrator of that Facebook group and ask if she's available to be interviewed um, about the topic and whether the administrator of that group would be willing to post a request for interviews of people who live with both cardiac disease and diabetes, for example. Um, The other recommendation that she had, her name is Sonia Collins. She's out of uh, 
Atlanta, Georgia. She's an excellent science writer and health reporter. She said that um, for those who have areas of expertise, clinical expertise, uh, like let's say cardiac health or cancer, that you contact the per, the organizations that are um, public uh, available to the public, and they are often l- looking for uh, sources as experts for when the media calls them, and let yourself be known there. So you may want to introduce yourself to that organization and have a meeting with them and say, I've been a clinician in this area for X number of years. I've published on this work. I have some ideas on how to better um, provide information to the public on this, and that might be another way for you to get engaged with the media. That's some really excellent advice. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you share some barriers that you've encountered um, throughout your career and how you've overcome those challenges? Sure. I face them a lot, and I think we all do, and I think being honest about them are the first step in seeing that we're all not alone on this. I have been at meetings when I worked inside the clinical environment where I'll tell a story without giving the identity of the institution or people. I was a director, and I was at a table of clinicians, and there were nurses there. One was doing some excellent research. And the male physician who chaired the meeting was talking about her research as though it was his research. Mm -hmm. And so I waited to see if she would say something, um, and she hadn't. And then I waited to see if her nurse manager would say something, and she didn't. And he wasn't my boss. So I raised my hand and said, you know, it's so interesting that you are speaking about so-and-so's research. She's in the room. I think it would be brilliant for us to hear directly from her. That was not well received. Um, I was shut down and I stood up to it and said, we are colleagues and respectfully, I believe that you would not appreciate if one of us was speaking about your research without it being accredited to you. So I've been in rooms with mainly men who do that to women and nurses, and I have uh, begun to speak out much more uh, quickly, and I think I do it fairly diplomatically. Um, if someone's back goes up, maybe it should. I also have encouraged other women now and have learned from other women in situations like that, that it's often better for the person whose words are being said that are not the person who's saying it, for someone else to be the person who says, hey, that was just what Erin said. That's so interesting. That's her study so that it takes the pressure off of Erin to speak up for herself, which might be difficult in that moment of shock. And her colleagues, both men and women, can do this for each other. So that's one obstacle that I've tried to come around. I am a member of the Association for Healthcare Journalists. Uh, We are over 800 strong, I believe. It's a national uh, organization. They have a yearly meeting where not enough nurses are on panels. And myself and Sean Kennedy at the American Journal of Nursing, uh, Liz Siegert, who is not a nurse but is a health reporter and a very big proponent and a friend and a colleague of nurses, uses nurses as sources in a lot of her stories. She's an expert in in aging and the elderly. We are always pitching nurses to be on these panels. So speaking up and standing up is a big job for all of us when we can. So on these listservs where reporters are asking for sources, the immediate response is some physician. And so we're careful not to only only recommend a nurse, but sometimes it should be an occupational therapist for that story or a physical therapist or a social worker. So diversifying the news source in health reporting is critical, just as it's critical that people of color and across gender identity are used as sources about stories across the spectrum. Because we are a diverse community, and if we're only hearing from physicians on health reporting, we are not getting the whole picture. And I'm not bashing my physician colleagues, excuse me. I'm suggesting that sometimes even they can say, You know, there's a nurse practitioner who's really versed in this, and I'm going to recommend her. I think there is a lot we can do for each other to expand and diversify sources in the media. I agree. Healthcare is definitely a team function, and it's important to hear other perspectives, not just from the one member of the team. Absolutely. Yeah. You also produce and host Health Cetera, which is a weekly podcast. What are some of the topics that you discuss on this podcast? 
Thank you. So we are on the air live on, it's every two weeks on a station called Little Water Radio, but all of our podcasts are available on almost every platform that you download your podcast from. So Stitcher, iTunes, etc. And you can also go to our blog called Health Cetera at healthmediapolicy.com and our Podcasts are also posted there, as well as blogs that are written around health policy, nursing, media engagement, the use of narrative writing, comics. Take a look, everybody. I think you'll enjoy it. (laughs) So Health Center is a podcast, and we provide evidence-based news, uh, analysis, and commentary. Uh, We are very committed to ensuring that our guests are from diverse, dynamic backgrounds. We do discuss a lot of global and national health affairs, health care issues, and a lot of policy. Many of our guests are nurse nurse experts, and we do that on purpose because we are nurses and our commitment is to raising the voice of nurses. We want to raise that volume on the voices of nurses so the public understands our multiple roles, our vast amount of knowledge, our capacity to make effective change, and that we have a commitment um, across populations for both individuals, families, and communities. So when I said earlier that my media work is my public health platform, Health Cetera is my platform for my public health practice. That's excellent. What inspires you to push forward as a nursing advocate? I'm a positive person. I am. An, when you're an activist, you have to be positive. I am fueled by this. As I said earlier, find what you're passionate about. You will have more energy than you know what to do with. People always ask me, how do you get so much done? And I tell them, I just, I do it with joy. I'm, I'm frustrated a lot. I mean, I have a lot of frustration right now politically in our country. I can't sit down and not act. Who will speak up for those whose voices are not being given a platform? Who will defend the human rights of people? Who will look at what's going on in immigration in our country? Pick a topic. Wherever you politically stand, share your expertise in that area and make a difference. I believe that my sense of feeling youthful and energized and impassioned has to do with the fact that I'm fighting for the rights of others and myself, my own rights. And I believe that social justice guides, hopefully, my work in in many, many ways. And until there is a better world, my work is not complete. I'm driven by my faith. You know, I'm a Jewish woman. Our tenant is to tikkun olam, is to repair the world. That is a responsibility and to make the world better than when you found it. Sometimes that's a big ask. And we're not asked to complete the task. We are asked to contribute to the task being completed. Absolutely. And I think that's also reflected in the ANA Code of Ethics, where it's a duty to speak up for others and defend their rights. Absolutely. And I think that's true for mostly all of our nursing professional organizations and Code of Ethics. I just want to add that I'm very, very concerned about what I see as a dangerous slippery slope around this conscious clause where people are suggesting that their faith tells them they can't take care of a certain person because of their gender identity or they're you know they're gay and want to be married and or their spouse is uh, they're a gay couple and their spouse wants to come in and be with them I mean we are seeing a rise in that type of behavior and my feeling is don't come into nursing don't come into health care if your faith will have you make decisions that will say, I'm not taking care of that person. Our responsibility, our oath and our license does not give us that right. And, you know, for those who work in the emergency room, when a criminal or a suspected criminal is brought in and requires trauma care, you can't stand by and judge this person. You must provide the care that this person has a right to. That is not our place. So for me, the ethics of being a nurse and the decision that I've made to be in this profession is part of the decision why I'm fueled to stand up for the individuals and families and communities who may not have the same freedom to use their voice and the platforms that I have made accessible to me. 
Absolutely. Uh, as a maternal child health nurse, this also affects this area um, when we start talking about women's rights and control over their own body. Absolutely. My grave. Yes. So, yes. This concludes our interview. Thank you very much, Barbara, for sharing your expertise and taking time to speak with the nursing economics audience. I appreciate the conversation and having an opportunity to be engaged in this lively conversation with you this evening, so thank you. The Nursing Economics podcast series is owned and produced by Genetti Publications Incorporated. All rights reserved. No portion of this podcast may be used without written permission. For archived episodes of this podcast and to learn more about nursing economics, visit the journal's website at nurseneconomics.net. You can also subscribe to the Nursing Economics Podcast on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, our hosting site Spreaker, and other various podcast delivery services.